Good afternoon, good morning, buenas tardes, buenos dias. My name is Laura Anderson Barbata. I'm speaking to you from Brooklyn on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, we recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware nations, their ancestors, and their future generations. I am a Mexican transdisciplinary artist, and I divide my time between Mexico and New York. I am on the board of directors of CAA, and I'm also vice president of the CAA annual conference and programs for 2022. And I'm also a happy member of CAA and have been for many years. <laughs> It is an honor for me to present to you today in our member spotlight, Miriam Ghani. Uh, I will now read her incredible prolific bio. <laughs> Miriam Ghani is an artist, writer, filmmaker, and teacher. Her works look at places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible forms and spans multiple disciplines. Her films have screened at the Berlinale, Rotterdam, CPH Docs, Doc New York, Sheffield Doc Fest, SF Film, Ann Arbor, FIDVA, and Il Cinema Ritrovato Film Festivals, among others. Her work also has been exhibited and screened at the Guggenheim, MoMA, Met Brewer, Queens Museum of New York, and the National Gallery in Washington, DC, the St. Louis Art Museum, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and CCCB in Barcelona, the Sarja Lahore, and Liverpool, Biennials and Dhaka Art Summit, and Documenta 13 in Kabul and Castle among others. Her early interactive work was presented by Riozom for Net Art Anthology, their history of net art in a hundred works. Some of her recent texts have been published in Eflux, Freeze, Foreign Policy, Triple Canopy, and the readers Assuming Boycott Resistance, Agency and Cultural Production, Critical Writing Ensembles, Dissonant Archives, Social Medium, Artists Writing from 2000 to 2015, and Utopian Pulse, Flares in the Dark Room. Ghani has received a number of fellowships, awards, grants, and residencies, most recently from Creative Capital, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York Public Library, the 18th Street Arts Center in Los Angeles, the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. Ghani is known for projects that engage with places, ideas, issues, and institutions over long periods of time, often as part of long-term collaborations. These include critical, curatorial, conservation, and creative work with the National Film archive Afghan films since 2012, with support from the media archive collective Pad.ma, and a number of international art institutions. The video and performance series performed places ongoing since 2006 in collaboration with choreographer Erin Ellen Kelly and composer Kasim Nakvi, and the experimental archive and discussion platform Index of the Disappeared, initiated with artist Chitra Ganesh in 2004, which has also become a vehicle for collaborations with other activists, archivists, artists, journalists, lawyers, and scholars. Ghani's first feature length film, the award winning and critically acclaimed documentary, What We Left Unfinished, premiered at the 2019 Berlinale and will be in US theaters in 2021. She is currently in production of her second feature, Disease. In 2020, she had solo collaborative museum exhibitions at the Blaffer 
Art Museum in Houston, and the Speed Museum of Art in Louisville. Ghani teaches at Bennington College. Also, Professor Ghani has been a member of CAA since 2002 and also served on the Diversity Practices Committee. <laughs> so we are honored to have her here today. And I know your schedule is extremely busy because of not only your production and your prolific work, but also because of everything that is going on right now that impacts you and your work today. Welcome, welcome, Mariam. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Lara. And I, I apologize, I should have given you a shorter version of the bio to read. <laughs> no, no, it's much longer, in fact, <laughs> and it should be. <laughs> so I hope people will go to your website, which is yourfullname.com, uh, mm -hmm. to really look in depth to your work, mm -hmm. your CV, and uh, your bio, and your mm -hmm. work. So let's talk about what's going on for you right now so, so very much. And I really don't want to take any time away from all the things that I know that you have going right now. Can you, can you please share with us, since you are uh, very involved and a research-based approach to your work, mm -hmm. uh, and it connects you with your Afghani roots. So please talk to us about what you are working on right now. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, when you were going through the, the super long bio, um, I have been involved for a long time with um, the National Film Archive of Afghanistan, uh, Afghan film, as part of my work with an interest in archiving, and particularly in the way that archives are involved in producing and preserving national imaginaries. And I was involved for much of the past decade in helping the National Film Archive of Afghanistan put together a, a conservation and digitization project, um, uh, which um, they had actually gotten quite far into uh, as of as of 2021. They had they had digitized um, almost two thirds of their archive. Uh, and also done a lot of work on recataloging and conserving it. So, you know, I had, I have, I have very, <laughs> very deep ties to many people <laughs> um, in Afghanistan that had been built up through through these years of work, um, including many filmmakers, archivists, and also artists. Um, some of whom I met during the Documenta 13 seminars in Afghanistan and some of whom I've just met over the years of, of making work and, um, and meeting people and being part of the cultural scene there. Um, so, you know, it's been in the last 10 years really extraordinary to witness this, this young generation come into their own as makers, as artists, as also art historians, um, as, you know, cultural workers, you know, as people who started art collectives and art centers, um, as people who were really involved in building building a cultural scene that was a big part of the, the growing civil society in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. And so when we reached this moment of crisis and deep emergency with the collapse of the government, which of course I'm also <laughs> very much related to, um, and feel very uh, responsible for in some odd way, um, repairing this, this damage that has been done. Um, I have since that moment been, been quite involved in, in efforts to try and help all of these people who invested so much in the dream of these 20 years, the dream of building this new Afghanistan, um, of rebuilding Afghanistan um, in this new way. So yeah, that's, that, that is much of what's been going on with me for the past month is really responding to appeals for help and figuring out pathways to, to deliver that help. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell us what the conditions are that uh, these uh, colleagues, friends, artists, activists, journalists, filmmakers, yeah. Uh, 
are what the conditions are they are living in now and also what are the uh, avenues that are possible to support mm -hmm. the, your efforts and their efforts in, uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in what is envisioned for them? What are they envisioning as, as, as viable routes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't wanna say anything specific about any individual um, situations because I think that that really would endanger people. Um, yes. I think in general, there's a lot of fear uh, about what a Taliban government may mean uh, for individuals and also in general, just for the very possibility of free expression uh, in, in Afghanistan. And I think we're already seeing that you know, the, the, the possibility, the very possibility of free expression has already been completely closed down in many ways. Um, and, you know, with music being banned very early on with, um, yeah, I think artists already have seen that it will be impossible for them to freely be artists. Um, and many have already destroyed much of their work um, and have been in hiding uh, in various ways. And I don't want to draw more attention to, to what they have done or how they are doing it in order to survive. Um, I think, you know, what we can do to help them uh, is provide, there's several things that we can do and there are several things that I've been working on with many, many colleagues who are also deeply engaged with this, including Lisa Ahmadi of the Asian Contemporary Art Forum, including European colleagues from Artists at Risk, um, which is a, a, an organization that works on this all the time with, with artists from many different countries where free expression is threatened and they have really jumped into the breach of this particular emergency in, in a big way. Um, also with, um, uh, there's colleagues from the Penn Heritage Center, from UNESCO, and many other organizations that have also been, been working very hard on this. And uh, in the film world, there's a whole other set of, of people and organizations that have, that have rallied to support filmmakers. There's also journal, journalism organizations that have done a lot of work to support journalists and, and film, filmmakers working more in the journalism space. So, you know, what, what we can do and what we have been sort of like working to, to set up as structures specifically for, for artists and, um, and cultural workers kind of associated with the art world uh, are, are several things in this specific moment. Um, and now I'm kind of speaking from the position of the, the sort of ad hoc coalition Arts for Afghanistan which grew up around this open letter, um, the Arts for Afghanistan open letter that, that was uh, uh, put together in August and um, is still accumulating many signatures that I believe were over 2000 signatures at this point, as well as more than, more than 80 organizations that endorsed it on an organizational level. Um, yeah, so that grew into a kind of ad hoc coalition uh, of, and a way to amass a lot of different resources. Um, among the resources that are the most needed at the moment, um, the best pathway out of Afghanistan uh, for people at risk at the moment is uh, humanitarian parole visas um, uh, for the United States and humanitarian asylum in other countries. In the United States, of course, we have the unique distinction of being a country that requires people to pay to apply for asylum, this this is really one of our one of our most unique qualities as a country. <laughs> um, and we not only require them to pay, we require them to pay five hundred and seventy five dollars per person. That includes children. Um, every person in a family has to pay five hundred and seventy five dollars. So, if you have a three month old, you even have to pay five hundred and seventy five dollars to file for the three month old, which is really it. It accumulates, you know. If you're bringing in a family of of six people already, you know, it's thousands of dollars. Um, so, 
yeah, there's an immense amount of fundraising that has to be done to cover these filing fees. There's an immense amount of pro bono legal support that has been uh, amassed to actually file all of these papers. And then, of course, every person, every family or every individual needs a sponsor uh, to file mm -hmm. for humanitarian parole in the United States. And this is where actually, you know, many of our member institutions, um, many of our members institutions also, and many of our members potentially because you can individually sponsor people, um, can step in and really make a huge difference in these cases um, by acting as sponsors um, for people seeking humanitarian parole. Um, it's a, it is a commitment in the sense that you are, you're taking responsibility for someone's survival. It's not a commitment in the sense that you are you are truly legally committing to support them <laughs> um, for for you know an indefinite amount of time, um, and especially not in the way that we are setting up these structures because we're actually for all the artists that we are trying to help we're we're trying to partner with with larger organizations to set up not just bring them here but actually set up residencies and fellowships. Um, for them so that when they come, their practices are also supported. Um, whether they're scholars or they're artists, they come and they're able to continue their work because I think that's so important. You know, when you leave your country and you come somewhere new, it can be so disruptive and so hard. It can be so hard to keep working when you lose everything you've known. And many of these people who are fleeing have had to leave behind everything they've ever worked on. Right? everything they ever made. Um, there's one filmmaker I know who, who was able to flee in the early days of the evacuation. She didn't even get to bring one hard drive with her. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which wow. is, yeah. <laughs> you know? Very difficult as, a, as, a, as an artist and who we, we have mm -hmm. so much has to do with archiving. And yeah. so I, I feel that at this point i think it's very important to urge everyone to log on to artsofafghanistan.org read the letter sign the letter and also if you could share with us uh more of uh, the resources that yes. we can go to and uh, receive more information on how mm -hmm. to support uh, yes. financially and also information on mm -hmm. how to sponsor people and uh, and continue and support in this in this way. So yeah. I really hope hope that uh, all of this information will well all of this information will be made available to our to our members and anyone watching. I also want to ask this: uh, the films that you uh, digitize or, or you archived. Mm -hmm. um, are they that that were in uh, part of the Afghan state? Do you know the state that the, that those archives are in? The work, yeah. all the work that you have done. Yeah. Well, let me let me just say first specifically, if people are interested in um, as academic institutions or on behalf of their academic institutions setting up some kind of scholars at risk or scholar at risk or artists at risk program, there's the IIE. Scholar at Risk Program and Artist Protection Fund that can match funds or match in kind resources for you. And there's also the New University in Exile Consortium um, that is running out of the New School, um, which uh, is a consortium of schools uh, working to set up um, Scholar at Risk and Artist at Risk programs um, in their institutions. And that's a great consortium to join also on an institutional level. Um, on an individual level, the Artistic Freedom Initiative is spearheading um, a lot of these legal efforts on behalf of artists, as well as the efforts to set up residencies and fellowships for them, sponsored residencies and fellowships for them when they land. And so that's a great place to donate um, time and money. <laughs> um, uh, and, and really, you know, they're, they're a great center for, for all of that. Um, okay, I just wanted to, to give the really specific instructions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank yeah. you. And links will be provided for everyone to yeah. go to. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so as far as concerns the archive, what has happened to the physical films as well as the hard drives uh, on which all of the kind of digitized material resided is really unclear at this point. 
Um, and we also don't know what the Taliban might plan to do with them. Um, I really don't have any any information about either of those things, either what what has happened to them so far or what might 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 be planned for them. Um, mm -hmm. What I do know is that you know we actually do have a number of the films, um, a number of some of the, the kind of great films of Afghan cinema we happen to have copies of because um, uh, between some Canadian colleagues and myself, we had who, my Canadian colleagues who worked on the film The Forbidden Real, which came out um, the year after my film What We Left Unfinished originally had its festival premiere. Um, so The Forbidden Real is also about the history of Afghan cinema. My, film What We Left Unfinished is much more narrowly focused on these five unfinished films that were uh, that were shot but never edited during the communist period 1978 to 1991. But because we were working on these films at the same time um, and I actually appear in their film as an expert on Afghan cinema, um, we became you know quite close colleagues and we collaborated on this effort to support the digitization project at Afghan Film. And during the making of The Forbidden Reel, which was supported by the National Film Board in Canada, a number of films were actually taken to Canada and scanned by the National Film Board. Um, and the NFB has retained copies of those scans. Uh, and then the films themselves were returned to Afghanistan, of course. Uh, and if my team that worked on What We Left Unfinished, my archival restoration team, which is actually based out of um, uh, the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, um, they uh, they volunteered to do additional work restoring um, feature films by the directors who were featured, who were who were interviewed for for my film, because as part of kind of the project of my film, what we left unfinished, we wanted to to kind of provide something additional to every every director whose kind of unfinished work we had we had kind of spotlighted, we wanted to also show off some of their finished films um, and, and give give audiences a glimpse into, you know, the work that they actually had finished and put out into the world as finished films um, to, to show this, this other side of their work as directors. Um, and so that that restoration team actually also had copies and I had copies of of some scans of full feature films because we'd been working on, we'd been continuing working on restoring and subtitling them. So between us, we actually we actually have about 15, 15, 16 feature films and some also some shorts, short documentaries and propaganda films. So not everything was lost because there have been these efforts, you know, to really to disseminate Afghan cinema, to to bring the history to light um, and to kind of, yeah, to because there had been these ongoing efforts at restoration and dissemination over the last few years, we actually are, you know, potentially going to be able to, to still continue doing that, um, mm -hmm. which, which is a small grace. It's a small grace note in this, yeah. Right. It seems like a project like this um, and uh, the title, What We Left mm -hmm. Unfinished, is also a it's project. It, it, it resonates in kind of a dark way yeah. now, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And yeah. you're uh, still working on it because there is still so much more. So um, your efforts right now are very much a, a response, an em emergency response. And I think that is uh, taking up your energy, your efforts, uh, all of your, your, your interest. Uh, and time because of the urgent matter. So are, is that correct? Am I, are you able to, to, to address other things? What is, how is your teaching being <laughs> impacted by this? Are they, your students joining you with this? Mm -hmm. there, there's so much activism and, mm -hmm. and archiving and uh, journalism and mm -hmm. uh, that is, that is part of your practice, there, there don't seem to be defined lines mm -hmm. between them. Are you filming here? Are you documenting here what's going on here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
There's, that's a lot of questions in one. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I, I, I am still teaching. I'm actually, I'm actually teaching four classes this term. So, wow. um, so that's, that's two of them are two credits. It's, it's okay. Um, it's a, it's a lot of, uh, so that's, that's also taking up a certain amount of my energy, of course, and I'm trying to be as present in the classroom as I can be, of course, you know, for, for my students who, who still need me regardless. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, students are, of course, aware of what's happening in the world beyond the college to some extent, <laughs> and some students, not all <laughs> students always. <laughs> um, but um, the college in general has been incredibly supportive, uh, and my colleagues have been incredibly supportive. Um, and um, yeah, the Bennington is actually in, in the course of setting up a scholar, a scholar at risk position. Uh, and um, we're also looking at other ways to support artists at risk. Even even though we're a teeny tiny college, we we actually have been doing as much as we possibly can, um, which has been really heartening to see. Um, and I am still trying to get some of my own work done. I'm in the midst of a, a really large public art commission, um, which of course you know had been in the works for quite some time. So that's still rolling along. Um, with the help of, you know, some really extraordinary colleagues, including my fantastic project manager, Jess Lee, um, and, you know, some great collaborators on that project who are, who are really, you know, taking, taking up a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the slack, but also like nudging me all the time to remind me that I need to make decisions about things. Um, and then my um, my current feature film, uh, well, what we left unfinished was in U.S. theaters. Also, like as all of this was was unrolling, what we left unfinished had just been released into U.S. theaters, uh, and some really beautiful things happened around that as well. Where my U.S. distributor actually decided to donate all the proceeds from from the virtual theatrical um, uh, streams that they were hosting to the Afghan Women's Network. Um, and many of the theaters actually decided to follow suit. And so, you know, the the screening of the film actually ended up becoming mostly, the theatrical release of the film ended up becoming mostly a really large benefit screen, series of benefit screenings, um, which was not not a planned thing, but just something that all these theaters and my distributor did totally spontaneously um, because they were moved to do it. Yeah. Right, because your work yeah. is activism as well. And so, for example, the Afghan uh, Women's Network that the film is supporting, what are mm -hmm. the programs? Ex explain to us a little mm -hmm. bit about, about that organization. Yeah, the Afghanistan Women's Network is a, a, an NGO that actually works primarily in Afghanistan and at the at the moment was working primarily with internally displaced people, like supporting internally displaced families. Um, also uh, the other uh, NGO that the, um, the proceeds are supporting is Women for Afghan Women, which is a, an NGO I've supported for a long time, which works both in the United States and in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, they, they ran a series of regional centers that supported um, women who, uh, you know, were victims of domestic violence and other forms of violence. Um, and in the United States, they actually support, you know, Afghan immigrant women um, through all kinds of different programs. Um, they also support girls' education in Afghanistan. They run emergency appeals as well, all kinds of different things. But yeah, they're an extraordinary organization that I, that I have been involved with for many years um, mm -hmm. on a on a pretty you know on a minimal level as an artist you know there's only so much you can only so much you can do you know, you're doing not, a lot not being <laughs> not being able to do philanthropy on the level that that actual philanthropists can can do because you're an artist and have an artist income <laughs> but yeah right yeah. but you yeah. have an artist platform and an artist <laughs> voice that really uh, really uh, extends yeah and because you work with so many different people 
mm -hmm. uh, scientists and uh, scholars of all sorts and historians, uh, artists of all sorts, it reaches a, a very, very wide audience. And that is what is truly uh, unique and powerful about your approach, mm -hmm. and your, your work. Um, so <clears throat> let's, uh, I, You're reminding me, actually, of there was this really kind of crazy moment right at the beginning of the, the crisis in Afghanistan in August when I was uh, finishing up the interviews for my current film, Disease. And for that film, I've been interviewing a lot of scientists and people who work in science studies in, in various ways, medical anthropologists, social scientists who focus on the history of, of technology and science and so on. and. The history of medicine, and I was um, I was running a remote interview um, with um, Edna Bonham, who's based in Berlin, and does a lot of work on the colonial history of medicine. And uh, she is Haitian American, <laughs> and of course I'm half Red American. And it was the day after the earthquake in Haiti, and it was the day after. Uh, kind of everything started collapsing in Afghanistan and we we just kind of looked at each other and we're like are you okay are you okay <laughs> should we still have this conversation yeah i think we probably still should okay so let's just put everything to the side for one second and have this still quite important conversation about the colonial like the legacy of colonial violence that persists in medicine today you know um, yes. yeah i yeah. found it I found it truly important and, and powerful the way that you look at the language that has been utilized and weaponized to describe uh, epidemics and uh, viruses and how it was, uh, it was strategically used also by governments to promote uh, political ideal, ideology and ideals. I, can you tell us a little bit more about these strategies because it really is so, so interesting and and the war on disease or war on germs <laughs> um this word war uh please tell us about mm. this yeah so disease is a project i actually started in 2018 well before our current pandemic it was it, started as a short film that was commissioned by the Wellcome Trust um, out of the UK for uh, a multi-city project they were doing called Contagious Cities around the centenary of the 1918 flu pandemic. So they had artists in residence in several cities and I was in New York, the New York artist in residence. And they gave me a very wide brief, which was just make something about cities and contagion and virality and migration. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's very broad. <laughs> um, yeah, I, can, I can do something with that, I guess. Um, but I'd never actually made any work about disease before or about public health um, or anything kind of related to that. I'd obviously, I've made, I've made a lot of work about immigration and, and migration kind of more broadly. And I've made a lot of work about language. And so I thought, let me start with language. Uh, and I started with the Susan Sontag essay on illness as metaphor, which I hadn't read in many years. So I reread it and I thought, huh, there is there's something here that I can definitely work with, which is this question of how the language that we use to talk about disease affects how we treat people who are sick. Uh, and it not only affects how we treat people who are sick, it, it actually really affects how we imagine sickness uh, and how we imagine treatment and doctors and outbreaks um, and public health and how we define the public in public health, who's included in that and who's excluded from that public, right? When we're talking about public health. Um, and kind of the deeper I went into these questions around language, the more interested I became in the metaphor of the war on disease because it was so dominant. It was everywhere and it had existed for much longer than I expected. 
I thought it was probably a Cold War relic, but actually it went back much further than that. And also it existed across multiple languages and across multiple cultures. And that also was not something I had expected. I thought it would be more of an American kind of phenomenon, but actually it really crosses a lot of, a lot of cultures. Um, and so I, I got really, really interested in this question of where this metaphor came from historically and what kind of work it was doing in the world now. And it's doing a lot of work in the world. Um, it's, it's a very active metaphor. Um, yeah. So and that, preventing a lot of work. Also and preventing, preventing a lot of work and also yeah. uh, uh, keeping a lot of people from access to, mm -hmm. to the opposite, which is health. Yes. Um, and how insurance companies are utilizing this language. It's, it's really a, a mm -hmm. really brilliant work. And it's also, you could read more about it on your website mm -hmm. and go to links that are, that are there that I, I urge everyone to, to consult. And the amazing thing is you were starting this, before, of course, before right now. Yeah. And, and you talk about how it's ongoing, but it also how it overlaps with language and attitudes about people from other outsiders or people from other countries. Uh, the whole, as you work with migration, how there is a, uh, in the in the germ world there is migration and how that is being mm -hmm. also um, weaponized against mm -hmm. us and uh, and how climate is never mentioned as part of it and how we are being uh, made responsible for our own sicknesses and diseases uh, mm -hmm. and that it's a strategy and so it's it's really fantastic I congratulate you for for all of your work it's 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 very powerful and very very important, and uh, you must uh, need ten assistants and to clone yourself because there's so <laughs> many projects that you're doing that need to continue. Mm -hmm. So I would like to also ask you mm -hmm. about your uh, experience at CAA, what it was like to be part of uh, mm -hmm. the committee, and uh, what it what impact it had on your work as an artist and uh, you mm -hmm. as a teacher as well as a professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, when I first joined CAA, it was when I was just leaving graduate school and starting out on my career as a teacher. And when I was serving on the uh, diversity practices committee, I think that overlapped with uh, my first teaching job actually, which was in 2005. So I started on the diversity practices committee in 2004 uh, and started teaching in 2005. So that was when I was sort of transiting out of being an arts administrator into being uh, uh, an educator. And I believe, okay, I, it's coming back to me now. I believe I, I, I got onto the diversity practices committee out of my it came out of my work at Exit Art because that's where I was working before I started teaching. And I had been working pretty extensively on their archive, of course. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was a grants writer at Exit Art. And one of my big projects there was actually to raise all the money to conserve and digitize their archive. This is actually the origin story for my obsession with archives. Oh. Um, yeah, is, uh, is my time in Exit Art's archive. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, no. <laughs> Thank yes. You. Yeah. This is this is something not many people know. Um, so yeah, I, I owe a lot to Jeanette and Colo. Um, but I think while I was doing all this research into kind of the the archiving projects that were happening in art at the time and these discussions around, for example the Conceptual and Intermedia Art Online project at the time, these discussions around expanding the Dublin core with new metadata terms to describe ephemeral and intermedia art. Um, the Alternative Spaces Archiving project was also really gearing up at that time. There was a, there was a big discussion happening around you know, how art history would be written um, and who would have access to which parts of art history, depending on which archives were preserved and digitized. 
right? Yes, of course. And that, that was my real interest actually in joining the Diversity Practices Committee was around this question of curriculum and how these kinds of archiving projects might inform the development of curriculum and the development of you know, art history and new art histories going forward, um, which I think they really have ultimately affected it profoundly. Um, if you look at the way art histories are written now versus the way they were written in the 90s, you know, our kind of canonical, our like big books of art history, I think are very different now than they were then. And it has a lot to do with, you know, this mass movement to digitize practices, digitize, make available online documentation of practices, which before were really inaccessible to people outside of specific cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for being a part of CAA and for all of your contributions. Mm -hmm. And we are so proud that you are a member of CAA <laughs> and that uh, to have had this opportunity to listen to you and for all our members to also have this opportunity to, to listen to you. And I urge everyone to go to your website, um, mm -hmm. mariamgani.com, and also to visit the website artsforafghanistan.org that that is a great one to start with yes mm -hmm. wonderful great yeah. well i'll reiterate the artistic freedom initiative is a great place to contribute volunteer hours to um, or to donate to if that's possible and um, also uh, the um, asian contemporary Art Forum is raising money specifically to cover filing fees. Um, and we'll, we'll have some more information on how specifically that will be done in a very short amount of time, which I can pass on to you. The Afghanistan Women's Network, AWN, and Women for Afghan Women, WAW. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mariam Ghani. This <laughs> has been a truly special and important and moving uh, experience and conversation with you and you leave us with a lot of work to do i think that's one of the things that you do for us is you ignite that urgency to act and respond not just to listen but to respond and thank you for that and i congratulate you for all your work mm -hmm. this has been an honor thank you laura it's been a delightful conversation thank you Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thanks.